All right, for tonight with the heart, as we finish up this chapter, we're going to begin with cardiac output. Cardiac output is a really cool measurement. And its name tells you what it is. Cardiac means? And what is put out of your heart? Blood is pumped out of your heart. So the cardiac output is the measurement of blood pumped out of the heart in one minute. The amount of blood pumped out of the heart in one minute. All right, it needs to be understood. I probably should say this because you're reading the bullet going, well, that's not exactly what it says. When I say pumped out of the heart, which chamber am I really talking about? Right now, we're talking about the left ventricle. Why am I saying left ventricle? Because that goes to the whole body, and that's what our focal point is right now. So this, as you see there, it says volume of blood pumped by each ventricle in a minute, but our focus is by the left ventricle right now. There's our little cardiac output. Bet you never guessed I was about to draw a heart. Have, how many hearts have you drawn so far? A lot. What valve goes right here? Which semilunar? Aortic. Very good. And it leads to which chamber? Or, va or which uh, vessel, I should say? The aorta. That's why it's called the aortic semilunar valve. Or, well, not my prettiest, but I'm just going to move on with this. This chamber pumps blood, correct? Cool. And each time it pumps, do you know how much blood it pumps out on an average person? It's kind of interesting. Watch this. Here's the chamber when it's full. And then after it pumps, it might look something like that. Did everything leave? No. It doesn't completely empty. That's the first concept I want you to have. When we're talking about the heart pumping and cardiac output, I want you to know that it doesn't empty. A normal cardiac output is somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 liters per minute. Does anybody in this class happen to remember how much blood an average person has? 5 liters. Five liters. That means that in a minute, you pump all your blood volume, basically. That's basically what that means. I think that's pretty cool. I don't think we had that concept, that the amount of blood that we have gets pumped through the heart every minute. And that's when we're resting. Well, how do you, how do you calculate or figure that? Here's how you do it. Every time the heart beats, it pushes blood out. And then if you just count the number of heartbeats in a minute, you'll get the heart rate. Was I erasing well? You'll get the heart rate times however much is pumped on one beat, which is called your stroke volume. This is the formula for cardiac output, heart rate times stroke volume. The book gives 75 beats per minute as average heart rate. And it gives 70 milliliters per beat as the average volume that gets pushed out here. The average amount of blood that gets pushed out. This is the average amount of blood that gets pushed out on one contraction of a ventricle. That's what I mean by beat. One ventricular contraction. <laughs> Hey, if you did the math here, it would actually come out to 5.25 liters per minute. Boy, that's pretty close to 5 liters a minute. We're just going to stick with the 5 liters a minute. Now, when we go back here, we can see all that stuff on the slide. Everyone needs to be able to calculate one of these if I gave you numbers, okay? Everyone needs to know that 5 liters per minute is a normal cardiac output for an average person. If your heart rate goes up, your cardiac output goes. Wait, hold on a second. Both of those numbers, look at this math. If either of these goes up, you multiply them together, that means this goes 
up, right? Okay, just making sure everybody got that. So if the heart rate goes up, your cardiac output goes up. If your heart pumps harder and pushes more with every beat, your cardiac output goes up. What if your heart rate goes up and your heart beats harder at the same time? Then it goes way up. And in fact, look at this. I love this one right here. Athletes can have a cardiac output of 35 liters per minute. Do they have 35 liters of blood? No, they have 5 liters of blood. They circulate it through their body 7 times a minute every eight point something seconds. Wow, that's crazy. I did read your lip. Okay, so anyway, even us normal folks, we can get our cardiac output up to 20 or 25. Look, watch this. This is crazy. We could say, hmm, right here, this is when the chamber is full, right? And look, after it pumps, whatever's left down there, we're going to say that's when it's empty or as empty as it's going to get, correct? You got that? So the difference between when it's full and when it's empty is called what? That's what the stroke volume is. That's how much got pumped out. The difference between those two. Of course, this is A and P. We can't call that full and empty. We have to put fancy words on both of these. EDV and ESV, which I don't want to confuse you. Just write them. I'll talk about them in a little bit after we've had time to digest this just a few more seconds. The abbreviation for when it's full is EDV. The abbreviation for when the chamber is empty is ESV. End diastolic volume, end systolic volume. I would never memorize full and empty as that. I would listen to the words and figure it out. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. So what if, what if your heart rate is 150 beats per minute. What would that do to this number? Exactly. It would double it. Wow. And what if this went up to, oh, let's say, 100 milliliters per beat? Somebody do the math here. That's why I picked 150 and 100. It's easy. 15 with three zeros. That's 15,000 milliliters per minute, but we're not measuring it in milliliters. We measure it in liters, so we just chop the three zeros off. I know you all remember metrics perfectly, right? So that's 15 liters a minute. That means that this is only three times normal. That means it could go up even more, a lot more than that. Maybe your heart rate could get up to 180, and maybe this could get up to 120. And maybe... When you're exercising, more blood's going into the heart, and that stretches the chamber more. You remember this? And that causes it to contract harder. Did we do that yet? Well, it sounds like we didn't. So we'll get to that in a second. Hey, there, look. Full minus empty equals stroke volume. It's just a little basic formula. Oh, yeah, so I haven't done preload and afterload and all that. That's what We're going to talk about some different factors that affect affect the stroke volume. What is stroke volume? Everyone needs to be able to visualize that and not get lost when you hear the word stroke volume. Stroke volume is the blood pumped out in one beat. So look up here with me. If this is my heart and it squeezes one time, what's that called? Stroke volume. Well, actually, that's called one contraction. But it produces the stroke volume. It pushes out so much blood. One stroke volume. If your heart rate's 60, you add up all 60 of those, and you get your one minute's cardiac output. Stroke volume is very, very important. Preload 
is the first factor that we'll talk about that affects stroke volume. I know how it goes when you hear new words like this. Preload is combining things that you totally know what that means. What's the load that the heart pushes? Blood. Everybody get that? What is the chamber full of before it contracts? Blood. So before it contracts, the chamber is loaded with blood. Pre means before. You know what load means. It's what it's full of. So preload is how much stretch is on a chamber. See, how full is the chamber? How much stretch is on the cardiac muscle fibers? I don't know if you have the concept, but when we talk about stretch and heart muscle, it only gets stretched from the inside. And what fills up the chamber to stretch it? Blood. So I'll always take you back to the PowerPoint now because it's so technical. I mean, you can read that, but it's, it's so simple. When you stretch heart muscle, it contracts with more force. It contracts harder when you stretch it up to a point and you can't overstretch it just like anything but up to a point if you stretch the heart muscle it contracts harder it's just easier for me to do it with this chamber so look there's an atria what if we fill it up with so much blood that we do this to it how do you think it would respond said it perfect. It would respond with a stronger contraction than normal in order to get the extra blood out. See, that's why it works like that. When you stretch heart muscle, the reason it's made in such a way that it contracts harder is because it needs to be able to pump what comes in it. What goes in must go out. That's our concept. If you are exercising and more blood flow is coming into your heart, your heart needs to be able to pump that out. The way that it does it is by stretch. It's not just the atria that do this. The ventricles do it as well. Increase stretch means there was probably an increase in blood volume and it causes a stronger contraction. This is known as Starling's Law of the Heart. Darling's law of the heart. What goes in must go out. Even independent of the stretch and independent of how full the heart is, uh, muscle cells contract with a certain strength at a given length. All muscle does. When it's a certain length, certain numbers of actin and myosin are overlapping, so it contracts with a certain strength. That's no big deal. I usually don't even ask about that because it just makes sense. Actin and myosin contract. If they overlap a little more, that's good. If they don't overlap enough, then that leads to a weaker contraction. But anyway, this is where I wanted to get. The second main factor that regulates stroke volume is called afterload. And I have to draw a different picture. I want a lot of room right here. What about that? Good, that's the aortic semilunar. What chamber is this? That's the left ventricle over here. Here's my question to you. How hard does this chamber have to pump just to get blood to move through that valve? How much force does that chamber need to contract with in order to move blood out. But how much force? It's real particular and specific. And it's so logical, you're going to go, oh, why didn't I say that? Oh, it's very specific. More than what on the other side is a pretty nice way to put it. What's on the other side? When the heart is at rest, 
the lowest pressure in the aorta would be 80 because blood pressure ranges from 120 to 80, right? Blood pressure is 120 over 80. What do we call the top number? Systolic. What do we call the bottom number? Diastolic. Those are your systolic and diastolic pressure. Do you know what those two pressures mean? When the ventricle contracts, I know some of you haven't listened yet, okay, and you're hiding and you're trying to be quiet because you don't want me to know. But when the left ventricle contracts and pushes blood up here, it pushes so much, it pushes extra, so it bulges this little vessel right here because there's extra blood going in there. And that drives the pressure up to 120. And that happens when the ventricle does what? Contracts. See? Systole means contraction. So the systolic pressure is the pressure when the ventricle is contracting. And it produces this little bulge that we call a pulse right here. You can count those because they roll through all the blood vessels and they eventually go under your radial artery. You can count it. That gets there because the heart beat happened and pushed it there and stretched the artery. Now, when that 120 moves to here and the bulge is up here, what happens back here? Narrows right back down and the pressure drops down to 80. Notice we didn't say it dropped to zero. The blood vessels never empty. They always stay full, and the minimal pressure for a normal, healthy person will be 80. It might be 70, whatever the number is. So the next time the heart contracts, it must contract with a force that will push the blood greater than 80, or it won't even get out. Does that make sense? If it pushed only enough to create 79 millimeters of mercury pressure here, it could not move out. It has to surpass it. By the way, diastolic is the relaxing pressure, right? So what I just taught you right here is afterload. Afterload is the force that the contraction must overcome to push blood out. It's the force that the contraction must overcome to push blood out. Or we could say... It's how hard the ventricle has to contract in order to get blood out. There's a lot of ways to say it. I never say afterload the same way. I don't have a nice, fancy, neat little rolling definition for you like network of glands, chemicals called hormones, travel through the blood. Riddle me this. If somebody's blood pressure is that number right there, how hard does their heart have to contract in order to just move the blood. Over 170. But let me ask you this question. If their pressure was this, if it just pushed one more, how much blood do you think it would push out? Would it push as much? The harder it contracts, the more it pushes, correct? Oh, so we want there to be some separation in these numbers, don't we? That tells us that the heart is pushing hard enough to get enough blood out. The closer these numbers are, that would tell us the heart, the heart's not cutting it. It's not pushing enough out. Do you know what the difference between these two numbers is called? That's called your pulse pressure. I feel like we talked about it, did we? In a lab? No? Um, Pardon? You heard it online? Well, I know I talked about it online, but I did talk about it with some class that I had this week. I thought it was you guys. But that was just last night. I actually thought I did it last week. What's a normal pulse pressure? Look, you subtract these two, right? It's the top minus the bottom. So a normal pulse pressure is 40. By the way, all of these things, we have to put units on. I'm being very sloppy here. Unit is always millimeters of mercury. If you don't have a unit, a number doesn't mean what it means. 
Okay, you can listen to the lab talk to find out why they call it a pulse pressure, but it's pretty obvious. Sometimes they name things so easy and they sound so complex. If you hear pulse pressure the first time you hear it, you don't know. Everybody knows what a pulse is, though. It's the bounce that goes under your blood, under your fingers, in your blood vessel. We know what it's created by now. The systolic pressure, the contraction, pushes it out. And then when it snaps back or recoils to that, you felt the bulge and you feel it go back, and that was the pulse. So how much pressure created that pulse? The difference between the pressure when this is bulged, which would be 120, over when it snaps back, which is 80. It took 40 millimeters of mercury to create that normal stretch or pulse. There's another measurement called mean arterial pressure. What does mean mean? It means average. The formula is the diastolic pressure minus one-third of the pulse pressure. Just write it down. We'll look at it in a second. Diastolic minus one-third of the pulse pressure. But I want you to think through this before we figure one out. If normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, what would you guess the average would be? If normal pressure is 120 over 80, that's normal blood pressure, right? During systole, it's 120. During diastole, it's 80. What would you guess the average pressure would be? I, I'm sorry. No, the average pressure is the average of how much time it's at 120 versus how much it's at 80. I'm not saying what a normal person's pressure is. See, this is a number they give as normal, but guys, 110 over 70 is quite normal as well. Okay? Anyway, I'm just referring to this number. The average, I think most people would think, oh, if you average those two, the average is 100. 20 greater than that, 20 less than that. That's not the case. Because our heart is in relaxation more than it's in contraction. It's only 120 at the bulge, right? And as the pulse moves out to here, the little 120 moves to here, all of this is 80. So it's at 80 longer. So the average is closer to 80 than it is to 120. The average is in the low 90. Yeah, the diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. I typically don't have people calculate that on a test. Okay? I know, you're like, why are you telling me now? So at least you would think about it a little bit. That's why. On this page, a few very important concepts. Afterload. Hmm. On the previous page, preload. When we're talking about the heart, the load is all about what fluid? Blood is the load. The preload is how full is the chamber before contraction. The afterload is how much blood is out there under what pressure that I have to push into. Okay? How full am I before? How hard do I have to push to get it to move? So that's pre versus after. I really dig those concepts, actually. Would you believe that high blood pressure, hypertension increases afterload? Yeah, that's what we just said, right? If somebody's bottom number is 90, now how hard does the heart have to pump to get blood to move? Enough to overcome 90. It has to work harder. See, this is why high blood pressure is so bad. This is why when the low number's up, it's really bad. It tells you how hard the heart has to work just to move blood. The higher the low number, the harder the heart has to work. Hey, when the top number's way up there, that's bad too. Because it tells you other things. It tells you how high the pressure's going. Periodically through history, when we're talking about blood pressure, 
they'll say, ooh, it's worse if the top number's high. Then they'll say, ooh, it's worse if the bottom number's high. And then they'll say, oh, it's worse if the top number's high. It's worse if, worse if both numbers are high. It's worse if either number is high. There's not a good high blood pressure, okay? They're all bad. If the top number's high, it means certain things. If the bottom number's high, it means different things. But it's all not good. Right, we already, we already did um, cover this. This is just a rehashing. Sympathetic nervous system. I do believe. Do you know what those sympathetic nerves are called? Cardiac nerves. They're called the cardiac nerves. Where do they come from? They go to the heart. Where do they come from? T1 through T5. T1 through T5. And this is just a reminder from AMP1 that the neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system happens to be norepinephrine. See, it's Thursday night. I know what happens on Thursday night. The week has caught up to you at work or whatever else you got going on. You had to come to night class on Wednesday. You were here late. And on Thursday, our brains are just a little more sluggish, a little slow. We've been doing extra stuff. So a topic after the first 45 minutes of talking, a topic simple like this still makes some eyes cross. All right? Sympathetics do what to heart rate? Raise it. Norepinephrine is like epinephrine and like adrenaline. We know that raises heart rate. You already have mental hooks for this. Don't forget you know that. It's just when it's released from a neuron, we call it a neurotransmitter. By the way, sympathetics can both increase the rate and the force of contraction. Parasympathetics, on the other hand, slow the heart rate and may decrease the force of contraction. It's the opposite. We know how to learn opposites. Own one, understand the other. Everybody knows, I'm sure, parasympathetics do what to heart rate? Slow it down. We even said the SA node likes to fire at 100, but because the parasympathetic nervous system dominates, your heart rate is not usually 100. It's usually slower, like 75. They call this vagal tone. Vagal tone. That means the vagus nerve giving parasympathetic input to a heart, slowing down the heart rate. And we all need to understand which neurotransmitter is parasympathetic. The first one you ever learned. The very first neurotransmitter we ever learned is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine makes your normal muscles do what? Contract. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that tells your muscles to contract. You may remember writing about it. You know, it depends what class you had for AMP1. But a lot of people write an essay, impulse travels down a motor neuron, reaches the axon terminal, opens calcium channels, calcium moves in. That causes the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine across the synaptic cleft. That stimulated a muscle. Here's why I said this. One, I wanted you to remember acetylcholine and that you already know it. Two, I wanted you to know it goes to muscle. Is heart a muscle? Yes, but here's the deal. The same neurotransmitter that activates your body muscles depresses your heart because it is released from the parasympathetic nerve to the heart, from the vagus nerve. So it, acetylcholine hits the heart it slows it down. You know how that happens? Because you're not going to be releasing acetylcholine to all your muscles and get real active at the same time as the heart. Those different nerves don't release it all at the same time. If you're releasing it to your body muscles and you're getting more active, you would probably shut down the acetylcholine to the heart to help speed it up. So it's another Opposite. And when I teach AMP1 and when we do uh, parasympathetic and sy sympathetic, I always make a big deal out of that. So it makes it easier on some people for AMP2. 
this says the same thing that we learned earlier. If you stretch a wall, in this case the atrial wall, it stimulates a stronger contraction. What stretches it? Venous return to the heart. Why is it going to contract harder? To get the blood out. This is just another name for what we said earlier. I've actually never asked this name on the test. I just like to say it again and reinforce what we did last time. We know these hormones. We had them on the last test. Epinephrine definitely increases heart rate and force of contraction. Norepinephrine does too. Thyroxin can as well. We know this because we remember hyperthyroidism, which is excessive thyroid hormone, which is also called thyroxin caused somebody's heart rate to go up and their body temperature to go up. Do you guys remember that? So it's stimulatory. That's just rehashing old stuff. I think it makes sense that you got to have proper ion concentrations for the heart to contract properly because depolarization and repolarization in the plateau phase are all about ion. So specifically here, calcium and potassium they're talking about. See, these are chemical regulators of heart rate. What we did prior to this was nervous system regulators. And look here. Age, gender, exercise, and body temperature all play a role in heart rate. The one, the two that I want to focus on really, the bottom here. As you exercise, what happens to body temperature? It goes up and the actual warming causes the heart to contract faster. They use the opposite in surgery nowadays. Sometimes they'll cool a patient off to slow the heart rate and to decrease the metabolic needs of the tissue, which is pretty cool. So if your body temperature is low, it would lower your heart rate a bit. When you get a fever, your heart rate would typically go up because of that temperature. And that's cool for exercise because when you warm up, your heart rate goes up just because of the warming, plus it's going up because of other reasons as well. If it's above 100, we call that tachycardia. And if it, the heart rate, is lower than 60, we call it bradycardia. I bet most of you learned that in medical terminology. Notice that bradycardia is actually a good thing if you have it all the time and if you're in shape. When you exercise, you work your heart, it gets in better shape, it pumps more effectively, it doesn't need to beat as many times to get the same work done. So your resting heart rate would be lower. However, if you take somebody who normally has a heart rate of 80 and all of a sudden you drop it to 50, they're not going to feel right. Okay? Because their heart's not pumping effectively at 50 to satisfy the needs, more than likely. And that leads us to the disease, or the condition, I should say, called congestive heart failure. Just a show of hands, how many people have never heard of this? See, everybody's heard of it. Now raise your hand if you can tell me what it is without reading it. It's one of those things that we've all heard of, but we don't understand. It's so simple. It's a condition in which the output of blood, the heart's pumping, it doesn't pump enough to satisfy your tissue's needs. Okay, visualize that. Heart pushes blood out. Blood spreads through the body. It goes to the capillaries. It sends nutrients and oxygen and water and all kinds of stuff to the tissues to feed them. But if your heart can't pump properly and not enough new blood is pushed out there, then your tissue needs are not met. A condition where the cardiac output is so low that blood circulation is inadequate to meet tissue needs is congestive heart failure. And it usually gets worse and worse and worse. That's why they say it's a progressive condition. Notice, first one. So we have to know what all these things are. Coronary means heart 
atherosclerosis. Placking. When you have plaques in the blood vessels of the heart, you're just not going to get proper nutrients to the heart. The heart's not going to be as strong. It won't pump as effectively. So, placking of blood vessels. Persistent high blood pressure. What's persistent? It means pretty much most of the time, all the time. That doesn't mean you exercise, your blood pressure goes up. That means you just have high blood pressure as a condition. We just learned when the blood pressure goes up, your heart has to pump harder. It wears it out. Over time, long-term high blood pressure wears out your heart. It just gets tired and it can't pump as effectively. Multiple myocardial infarctions. Those are heart attacks. In the lab, it teaches you how to define them. It's an area of heart muscle that has died because of lack of oxygen. Well, if you have a heart attack, that means part of the heart muscle has died. It can never heal itself. That's the way it works. You don't grow new heart muscle. Once it's dead, it's dead. So that part of the heart, if it's really small, it would turn into connective tissue and just not contract. The rest of your heart could still contract. It could still push blood out and you can survive that. If you have another one and another one and another one, more and more and more areas die off and eventually it gets to where the heart can't pump effectively. Okay? And a dilated cardiomyopathy, I'm guessing very few people have heard of that. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Perfect score this week. Nobody in any class had ever heard of that. All right. Dilated means? It's enlarged. But it doesn't mean thick. It means ballooned out. Okay? This is when the chambers become large because the muscle around them becomes weak. So they get weak and they get distended. And that weak heart muscle is flabby and floppy and doesn't push right. Okay? The walls actually will wiggle and not push right. Well, obviously that's a bad thing. And that is chapter 18.